Hi, it's Manik once again, and I'm back uh, with another video. And uh, you know, we were going through the series of lecture, and it was on uh, the European classics. And uh, till now, we have completed two. One is an epic written by Homer, that is Iliad, and especially the book one. And then we have a we have done also a tragedy written by Sophocles. Oedipus the Rex or you can say the Oedipus the King. Now our today's concern is another play and the name of the play is Pot of Gold and it is written by Plautus. So without uh, no delay or you could without, even say without further delay we, we will now begin it. Okay so let's talk about uh, Plautus. Who is Plautus? Uh, about Plautus there is not much is known and his full name is Titus Machios Plautus and it is believed that he was born in Sarsina and that Sarsina is a kind of small town and especially in Emilia Romagna and it is actually situated in the northern Italy and it was around 254 BC he was born and then his Acting talent was uh, eventually discovered later, and he was adopted the names Macius. Okay, her name was firstly that uh, Titus, uh, you can say Titus Plautus, and that Macius was given name. And that uh, history is that like that, it is a cone stock character in popular force, popular farces. So that's why that Macius name came across. And here the term Plotus, that is the surname, is a term meaning either flat-footed or you can say flat-eared. So that's how like the name came. Now Plotus wrote around 130 plates and of which only 20 have survived. And this 20 plays, making him the most prolific ancient dramatist in terms of the surviving works he have he had written. And if you uh, consider Plotus, he ranks with Terence as one of the two great Roman comic dramatists. And if we talk about his works, uh, that is many present scholars with a variety of textual problems considered him at the epic center. And nevertheless, uh, his literary and dramatic skills make his plays enjoyable and especially in their own tactics. And his achievement of his comic genus has had lasting significance in the history of Western literature and especially in the field of drama. Now let's talk about the title of the play. Actually, the plot or the pot of gold have an another title. Actually, the, it's a original title, and the name of it is Alleluia. Okay, and the spelling uh, stands out like that: A U L U L A R I A. You can say Alleluia or you can say Alleluia, okay, and it is a Latin play, and then it was later translated, okay, and then the name Pot of Gold uh, was given. The title literally means the little pot, okay, but some translators provide the Pot of Gold, that means the Alleluia comes from like that, uh, comes from like that, and the pot uh, revolves the storyline revolves around a literal plot with having that pot of gold. And who is the miserly protagonist of the play, Eucleo, guards the lastly. Okay, now let's talk about the uh, actual setting where the play took place. Uh, it is a street near Athens and Mostly, it is before the houses of Euclid and Megajoras, and that the shrine of Fides. Okay, just remember the name, the shrine of Fides. It plays a significant role in this play. 
and if we talk about the play a little bit i like all the classical drama okay and the prison play that means the fort of gold is written in verse and certain sections are meant to be sung by the actors okay and we have uh, around set five of uh, these lyrical passages to music and in ancient times there were sung by uh, the accompaniment of aulos you know aulos is a kind of a double uh, reed instrument and similar to uh, to an oboe okay now all the, the characters in the play speak latin really everything else about them is greek they have greek names they have greek clothing and of course they are like have greek costumes too and the action takes place on a residential street which i have already discussed in athens okay and uh, you know all of plotus's actors were men and all are either boys or men okay and they all must and the pot of gold would have been performed without any kind of intermission as we to perform it okay now let's talk about some key characters in the play first of all we have euclio euclio is the central character of the play and he is a, a widower okay and the father of a, a very beautiful and very pleasant uh, girl named phaedria okay the spelling is p a s r e d r e a phaedria or even say phaedria okay now next character lar familiaris okay lar familiaris is the guardian spirit of euclius house and uh, before uh the play begins uh, at that particular point there was a kind of prologue and in that part he plays a significant role ne then we have a staphila staphila is the housekeeper you can say maid servant and uh, she is kept she is kept uh, to to look after euclius house and his daughter but we know when uh, at the beginning he is a uh, uh, banished from the house due to the skepticism of euclio now next uh, next character is uh, megadorus uh, megadorus is the uh, brother of uh, eunomia and at the same time he is the maternal uncle of lycondius and he plays a very significant role as uh, uh, he wanted to marry that uh, the daughter of euclio that is uh, a patria okay now next character eunomia eunomia's character is already discussed she is the uh, sister of uh, megadorus and uh, he is, uh, she is also the mother of uh, lycondius Contius. Okay, and uh, she has a very significant role too, and we will discuss in the uh, uh, summarization of the play. Now the next character, Lycontius. Uh, Lycontius is the son of uh, Eunomia and the uh, uh, seducer of uh, Euclius' daughter. That is a uh, uh, fit. Actually, he uh, ripped that girl uh, before earlier and now in a mood to marry her okay so that's how the character of lycondius is a kind of complicated one and at the same time uh, he is a very good and very gentleman kind of character at the uh, end of the play we will uh, come across now next character is strobilus strobilus is the steward of uh, megatorus okay now the last but not the least uh, that is anthrax and uh, congrio these are the uh, uh, the two cooks uh, who whom uh, megadorus brought and uh, gave to the house of euclid now let's uh, go to the play okay the play begins with a prologue and in this prologue the lar guardian god of the household tells us that when tells the audience about euclid who is euclid actually a poor stingy man who lives alone and uh, except for an old housekeeper and the name of that uh, old housekeeper is staphila and uh, he lived with another person and uh, she is uh, euclid's daughter and has name her, her name was uh, phrytia and uh, she has a kind of a nickname okay and that nickname was ola 
and you know ola is the uh, translated uh, sorry it's it, ola it's translated like that in english that it's a kind of pot okay now ukulele has uh, now no idea how to uh, give uh, his daughter to marry because he is very much poor and he had also no idea that his daughter phaedria is pregnant and about to give birth and she had just discovered a kind of a pot okay and that pot was filled with gold and in that frantic mood that uh, someone may steal it so he was in very much a over curious mood and at that point the guardian god the lord assures us that the pot of god will eventually enable a uh, phaedria to marry lycondius and the young man that lycondius uh, uh, who loves her and has fathered her baby so that's how the prologue uh, ends now uh, scene one and scene two and in scene one and scene two we uh, have come across that Euclio drives Stifler out of the house and he was in suspect that that girl that maid servant can steal his gold so that's why he absconded that uh, uh, maid servant that servant Stifler okay and then we uh, came across that he then leaves for the marketplace and he is now in a mood to uh, uh, find a kind of free handout okay now uh, scene 3 and scene 4 and 5 uh, Eunomia the character we have already came across has come to visit her bachelor brother Megadorus and you know that Megadorus was a, a neighbor to Eclipse so she that mean uh, Eunomia advises Megajoras to get a wife. Actually, his age words going on to the uh, words that been to old age. So he need he needs to marry. So it's kind of a, a advice from her. He was at the first very much reluctant, and then he soon relents and decides to ask Euclio for his daughter's hand in marriage. But one thing, the very uh, concept that is that the girl is already pregnant was not known to him. At Eunomia defaults, Euclio saws up and he is persuaded to accept Megadorus' proposal. So Megadorus is now in, in a mood to appeal to please that got that meant Euclid in marriage then Megadorus volunteers to pay for two wedding feast that means it's a kind of uh, uh, offer given by him to uh, Euclid that I will give or I will take all the responsibilities in the marriage you have nothing to pay you have nothing to waste in that marriage I will arrange everything and in that wedding there will be two feast in your house and in uh, in my house and those feasts will be uh, done by me and all the cost of that of those two feasts will be uh, taken by me he takes his uh, slave that 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 man the name is Stropilus, with him to the marketplace so that he can help Euclid by uh, sending him uh, with cooks and supplying of food so in that mood, we have a uh, very much conscious about Megadorus's idea. He is now in a mood to uh, please that guy, that Euclid, in any how. So Euclid, after giving directions to Staphila, uh, leaves uh, to go shopping himself. So that's how the scene number five ends. Now, uh, from six to uh, scene number fifteen, in that uh, uh, scenes. Among these scenes, we will come across that Strobilus lives back from the market and he is now coming back with four cooks. But uh, the but these cooks are, are very much silly, very much a dull kind of personality. So after lamenting their bad reputation as crooks, 
the cooks enter Euclid's uh, house and Megadorus' house. So uh, you, you need to know that two cooks were sent to Euclid's house and two cooks were sent to uh, Megadorus' house. Then Euclid returning home find that his home is filled with commotion and he was very much worried chases everyone out sure that his gold has been stolen and at that very point finding it that his pot of gold is still safe he lets the cooks continue with their work while he carries the pot with him under his cloak so at that point the scene uh, 15 ends now uh, we will discuss uh, from scene number 16 to scene number 18 in that scenes we have found that Megadurus comes on stage and he is reflecting on the wisdom of marrying that poor girl Phaetria and without taking any kind of dowry in that uh, uh, society which in which he was living there was a kind of tradition whenever a girl is married to a boy a girl's family have to give a large and handsome amount of dowry so now that Megadurus was feeling very much uh, happy and very much uh, like that gentleman kind of character and in a kind of a, uh, monologue you can say in a kind of a soliloquy he is uh, talking about himself and how noble he is and that speech okay that, that the soliloquy was Euclid was a very much uh, in a kind of near place and he overhearing everything in the form of that song and he becomes very much pleased with the sentiment which Megadorus actually sawing and especially uh, wanting to marry his daughter only to get uh, that girl not uh, in the greed of the gold he is possessing. So it's a kind of a very uh, uh, positive kind of science to him. Megadorus uh, lips for the preparation uh, for the waiting and at that time Euclid goes into the sign of fights okay now I am giving you the actual uh, reference of it you know the sign of fights is a very much uh, a kind of a pure place and the the sign is very much uh, believed to be a place of trust and faith okay that's why Euclid have chosen that sign okay to hide his spot there now for the first time our, our second uh, you can say hero that is Lycondyx is uh, remembered because Lycondyx is slave and the name of that slave was uh, a Pythodicus okay you can say Pythodicus he appears and having been uh, sent by his master to spy out that situation that Euclid was doing and he boasts about his perfect behavior and that's how the scene ends now from scene number 19 to scene number 23 at that point we have seen in the stage uh, on the stage that Euclid talking to himself about his gold he was possessing and as he leaps to the shrines he was overheard by Pythodicus or Pythodicus. As soon as Euclid enters his house, the slave rushes into the shrine to steal, to steal the pot, to uh, get the pot in his position. At that moment, very surprisingly, the sound of a bleating sheep sends Euclid uh, a kind of alarming call. And Euclid, at a moment, running back into the shrine to take on the goal. And by reaching the air, he found Pythodicus there. And he was very much enriched. He drives him out and interrogates him with very much significant and insignificant all types of questions. Finally, letting him to go when he says that the slave is empty handed. And then he decides that when Euclid decides. This is not the perfect place to uh, to keep that pot of gold. So he was now in a mood to hide the pot in a remote grove. 
as he exists after keeping the pot of gold he is followed secretly by Pythodicus because Pythodicus was not uh, far away he was uh, abused he was threatened but he did not uh, go back to the uh, master's house he was rather present at that uh, point and he was overhearing what was actually Euclid doing now from scene number 24 to 28 Lycondius and his mother Eunomia arrive at Megadrus's house. Lycondius uh, appealed to his mother that he is in deeply love with that Calphatria and especially he has a kind of a, a prior relation with her and he has conceived in the womb of Phaetria his baby. Eunomia, having learned the truth from her son, goes inside the Lycondis and to convince her brother to abandon his wedding plans. At that point, Pythodicus joyfully runs, but with a pot of gold he has a, a pilfered. After him comes Euclid, and he was bemoaning because his pot of gold was thrived. At that point, Lycondius now confesses to Euclid and reports that her daughter, that when Phaetria, has had a baby of him. Euclid now uh, very much uh, uh, in a depression mood and he races inside his house and confirms this, that that guy, that slave Pythodicus had stolen his pot of gold and having hidden the pot in his master's house. He brags to Lycondys about the theft and asks whether he can buy his freedom with the stolen gold. So, the Pythodicus uh, have stolen this pot of gold not because of his personal greed not because of uh, his own satisfaction or own gratification and lead a life of luxury. He is a slave and to him his freedom is most important. And for that reason he wanted to satisfy, he wanted to please his master that is Lycondice. Lycondice was very much offended and he orders him to give the pot back to Euclid because he is now Thifting a thing, a pot of gold from a person who is now going to be his father in law. So he was very much uh, uh, offended with the uh, deeds of his, self, uh, of, of his slave. But at that moment, at that particular moment, a uh, true heart has been evolved out from that person, that Lycondis. Previously, we have come across that he raped uh, Putria. Uh, that riffing was uh, done in the uh, midst of the night and even Phaedria did not know actually who is that culprit. But Lycondus knew he was that culprit. He could uh, escape himself from that place but he didn't. And that's the true nature of the lover has been evolved out. And at that very point the text uh, comes to an end. But uh, if we uh, think uh, very deeper, uh, we will uh, think that the play comes to an end with happy note. Maybe at that particular point there was a, there was there should be an epilogue, and in that epilogue, that guardian god of the family, that Lar, will come on the stage and uh, and uh, speak to all the audience about the happy ending of the play. So this is how the actually uh, the story ends. Now I am giving you some key questions uh, which I have uh, 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 <coughs> picked out for you. And this time I will not give you the answer. So it is my wish that you should go through the, all the questions and then try to find out the answers and write down all these answers by 1, 2, 3, 4 in the comment section. 
I think it will be kind of a great experience you too. Okay, so let's discuss about the questions. The first question, name the domestic deity who held Euclid, the spelling is a little uh, uh, changed here, Euclid maybe, uh, at the beginning of the play. Okay, this is the first question. The second one, among Plotus's written plays, how many have been survived? Okay, how many have survived? Now the next question, what is the Italian title of the play? Now the fourth one, who suggested Megajoras that he should be married soon? Now the fifth one, how did Megajoras persuade uh, Euclid in marriage? Okay, now the sixth question, question number six, how many cooks were brought by Megajoras? And by whom? Number seven. In which shrine did Euclid want to hide his gold? Question number eight. Name the slave who persuaded Euclid to the shrine. Question number nine. Why did the slave of Lycondius steal the plot of sorry pot of gold? Question number 10 and the last but not the least, name the maid servant whom did Euclid abscond it at the beginning of the play. So these are, see all these are the questions you need to uh, solve each, solve this by yourselves and if you have any kind of queries about this play, you can ask me in the comment. So thank you and have a